So for this last lecture, I wanted to uh, change gears a little and focus on uh, organ development and regeneration. Um, so does Paulo remember what the difference between tissue repair and regeneration is? <laughs> Paolo, ti ricordi Fine. la differenza? Uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. La differenza tra riparazione e rigenerazione tissutale? <ride> per la, la, cioè, la differenza sta nel fatto che nella um, riparazione c'è la cicatrice, cioè si forma la cicatrice. Ok. It's correct? Very good. Ok. Right, so the regeneration is the perfect uh, replication of the organ. And to understand regeneration, there is a prerequisite to understand how you develop the organ in the first place, right? So regeneration is just the re repeat or reiteration of the initial developmental uh, process. So the general idea in the field is that in order to um, control regeneration, you need to understand how the organ is developed in the first place, right? And so what I'm going to talk about is how we use the hair follicle as a model system to understand regeneration. Because as I've mentioned before, the hair falls out and regenerates, right? And we can genetically manipulate the hair without it being um, detrimental to the mouse, right? The mouse is nude, it doesn't matter. I don't know what kind of psychological problems it has, but physiologically, it's, it's normal. Okay, so, you know, this is actually quite a big topic. How do you, under, how do you understand organ development? So, essentially, the question can be, how do you understand how organs form in the first place, right? And so one method that people have used um, is basically to break it down into simple what's called morphometric modules and, and identify the signals that guide their formation. So different types of building blocks or different structures that are used, right? So I'll, I'll go over that uh, in more detail. Uh, the second thing, once you identify the anatomical changes, is what are the uh, changes in the cellular anatomy that occur uh, during morphogenesis? And the third one is basically uh, to understand at the molecular level what is the cause of those changes and uh, in particular how it changes uh, sh uh, shape, polarity, movement, adhesion, and proliferation of the cells in order to create a three-dimensional organ. Uh, allora, questo, questo pomeriggio vorrei concentrarmi sullo sviluppo e sulla rigenerazione degli organi, eh, ho, chiesto, ho fatto prima una domanda che riguardava la differenza tra la riparazione e la rigenerazione tissutale e la differenza è proprio che nella eh, riparazione eh, ci, mh, si forma una cicatrice, eh, mentre la rigenerazione è in realtà la replica perfetta del, del tessuto. Um, per uh, capire uh, effettivamente per controllare la rigenerazione uh, si, deve, uh, si deve capire qual è effettivamente quale sia lo sviluppo degli organi uh, e anche uh, approfondire il tema dei, uh, dei follicoli piriferi proprio per capire questo procedimento uh, e questo è un argomento molto importante per, proprio perché ci aiuta a comprendere qual è il meccanismo qual è lo sviluppo uh, degli organi stessi e quindi come possiamo uh, capire in, in, come come si formano eh, gli organi? Questa è la domanda che ci poniamo. Possiamo farlo attraverso eh, tre modalità differenti. La prima trovando dei moduli, dei moduli eh, morfometrici. Eh, la seconda è descrivendo i cambiamenti che avvengono all'interno dell'anatomia cellulare e la terza metodologia è proprio eh, comprendendo e capendo eh, quali siano i programmi molecolari. Oh, that's it. Can you tell, so the definition of morphogenesis is just development, uh, organ development. La definizione di morfogenesi è proprio quella di sviluppo degli organi. Okay. 
So what does this mean, this morphometric modules? Che significa moduli morfometrici? Uh, so what it, it basically means is the different types of structures that are formed that ultimately shape an organ. So if you look at different organs, some are made out of tubes. So you could form a tube like your uh, vascular network uh, or is a system of tubes or the uh, tubules in your kidney are just basically how do you form cells that form a hollow, hollow tube. Another type of um, morphometric modules are branches. So like in the lungs, you have uh, initial uh, line of cells and then they branch off, right, to form, to form these kind of branches. And the third type of morphometric model is this buddy morphogenesis where you have a sheet of cells and this basically has a structure that kind of buds out of it, right? You could either form a tube or a branch, but this initial buddy morphogenesis seems to be a um, precursor to these other two types of uh, morphometric uh, modules. So, yeah, go ahead. Eh, quindi la differenza, concentriamoci sulla differenza delle varie tipologie di struttura che vanno proprio a formare gli organi, qui vediamo tre tipologie eh, morfometriche differenti, tre modelli, il primo consiste in una sorta di tubo, come potete vedere nella prima immagine in alto, il secondo è una sorta di ramificazione, eh, mentre il terzo è il budding, quindi vedete le due tipologie eh, una più pronunciata e una meno pronunciata, legate sempre alle prime due. Ok, so when do these types of uh, modules form? So I just want to give a brief, very brief background on embryonic development of where these tissues come from. So as you guys know, the, the zygote of the fertilized egg is totipotent. And what does totipotent mean? Cosa significa totipotent? <laughs> che è dalla, una cellula in grado di dare origine a tutte le cellule dell'organismo insieme agli annessi embrionali. Cioè ai tre foglietti dell'organismo, cioè endoderma, mesoderma ed endoderma, e in più anche gli annessi embrionali. So what's the difference between pluripotent and totipotent then? La, una cellula pluripotente in grado di dare origine a tutti i tipi di cellule che derivano dai tre foglietti embrionali, ma non agli annessi embrionali. Oh, ok, so you, you say embryons is basically the extra, uh, the placental, kind of extra embryonic tissue. No, 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 okay. Yeah, that's right. Ok, <laughs> <laughs> okay. so uh, you have a totipotent uh, zygote that uh, divides into form a morula and then the blastocyst. Yeah. And, and then you have this, what's called the inner cell mass, within the, which is the, um, within the blastocyst. And it's these inner cell mass that you can culture to form the embryonic stem cells in cultures from the inner cell mass, right? And these are what's called pluripotent, that can form any body, uh, so any tissue in the body. Totipotent means every tissue in the body plus the uh, extra embryonic tissue that's surrounding the thing, not the embryo itself, okay? And then, as he mentioned, uh, you have gastrulation following the um, blastocyst and inner cell mass formation where you get the, the three layers of the um, embryo, the ectoderm, mesoderm, and endoderm, right? And these are multipotent, right? So it's generally thought that these, uh, fall, these cells can only form the tissues that are within the classification, right? So ectoderm is where skin and uh, your nervous system is derived. Mesoderm, you have heart and skeletal muscle, among other things. And endoderm is pancreas and liver, okay? And so the question is then, how do we understand organ development or organogenesis at a genetic level where if you do mutations, you might lose that structure, right? So you can't do genetic models on, uh, say, your heart and pancreas because if it's lethal, the animal will never survive. Right? So you want, the, the ideal structure would be something that maintains this developmental program but is dispensable to the, or, to the organism so that if it's lost, it's not, the animal's not going to die. Right? So you have a chance to look at what's going to happen. So that's why there's an advantage uh, for the skin and hair as a model organ system. So like I mentioned in the previous talk, in vivo it's amenable to genetic uh, manipulations. We could knock out genes, add genes and test the in vivo function of them. And um, 
as I mentioned, it's not critical for the development and viability of the whole animal, right? So mice themselves and even some humans can are viable until birth in the absence. You don't need an epidermis, right? You can survive all the way up to birth, and then you'll die later because of the lo uh, water loss. But you can go quite far in development. And as I mentioned, the loss of hair does not impair the uh, health of mice that are housed, right? So that they're, they're nude is fine. It's also easy to score defects because you can just look at the animal and tell if something is wrong with it. In vitro, as I mentioned before, it's easy to culture the adult stem cells or progenitor cells. And as I mentioned, they maintain their um, uh, stemness in vitro because you could put them back in an animal and they still would behave as stem cells. And this allows you to do the biochemical and cell biology techniques to elucidate the uh, intracellular signaling pathways that guide morphogenesis. Um, allora, quindi abbiamo parlato della, della formazione delle, degli organi, uh, un piccolo background, un veloce background sullo sviluppo degli, degli embrioni, uh, la risposta alla domanda precedente riguardava il, proprio il fatto che il totipotent riguarda tutti i tessuti all'interno del corpo. Uh, vi sono tre strati delle embrionici come possiamo vedere qui sì, okay. eh, ognuno si occupa di un aspetto particolare quindi eh, gli organi che avete visto nella precedente slide eh, qui si parla dei vantaggi proprio della, della pelle dei peli nel, nel sistema degli organi eh, facendo una differenza tra i, tra i test in vivo e i test in vitro ok So as I mentioned, it, the, the dogma in the field for a long time was that if your uh, skin stem cell, you're only going to be able to form skin, right? Or skeletal muscle can only form skeletal muscle. You can't go up and to another thing. So for instance, it was not known for a long time that the skin stem cells can be reprogrammed into, let's say, heart, right? That was impossible. But uh, in 2012, uh, the Nobel Prize was given for the ability to reprogram dermal fibroblasts, okay? So what they did is they basically took fibroblasts from the skin, added in these transcription factors to be able to reprogram, to make them look like pluripotent stem cells. And these pluripotent stem cells, regardless of the fact that they were derived from the uh, skin fibroblasts, they were able to make muscles, brain cells, blood cells, and different types of cells, right? So the um, model that you're basically stuck within the same pathway, to a large extent now, seems to be um, not completely true. It says you actually can go backwards and then cross the different types of uh, organs that form. Okay? So that's what's called plasticity of the cell. It has uh, the potential to actually become a, a lot of different things. Now, the, the reason why I bring this up is that If, even if this came from the skin and you reprogrammed it into a pluripotent stem cell, you still need to know what the signals are to make this pluripotent stem cell a muscle or cardio, cardiomyocyte or whatever you want. So there's still basic biology that needs to be done in order to say, how do you convert this into any type of organ that you're interested in? Okay? Question? Domande? Come hanno potuto riprogrammare i fibroblasti della pelle per ristabilire insomma, i corretti livelli di OCT34 Nano G? Quale? Nano G. How did they do it? Come hanno fatto? Yes. Yeah, so basically they just added in plasmids into the cells. Ah, with the plasma. It's all okay. um, artificial. You can take the skin cells out in tissue culture, and then, well, they use virus. So they use viruses to introduce OCT4, SOX2, ah, okay. and uh, NANOG. Ah, Attraverso il virus. <laughs> so, go ahead. What about external stimuli to turn it backwards? Um, people have been doing, uh, looking at this uh, external stimuli. And there was a Nature paper in 2014 that claimed that if you just put acid on the cells, to, it's what's called stress-induced pluripotency. 
Um, it turned out that the data was faked. <laughs> so, and actually, one of the guys who was part of it committed suicide because uh, they ruined his career. So don't, don't make up data. Um, but the uh, people are looking to see whether, yeah, it, instead of adding in the transcription factors, can we give it some external signal or stimulus to induce the expression of these guys and then uh, and do it. So, and actually what the um, work that people are doing is instead of these external stimuli, they're coming up with uh, small molecule chemicals that could they just add to activate uh, the endogenous expression of these. So uh, they're trying to look for chemical ways uh, of doing this. So a lot of people are jumping on this um, bandwagon of how to you uh, make this reprogram uh, reprogramming process quite easy. And actually now, uh, in Vitrogen sells a kit that you can just buy the kit, add the stuff to your cells, and I mean, the ones that we've used, 90% of them get reprogrammed, so it's not, not an issue. Okay, I, I should say 90% success rate of getting reprogrammed cell, but the efficiency is 0.01% of the cells in your tissue culture plate <laughs> are actually gonna be reprogrammed. So that's the problem, is that the efficiency of reprogramming is so poor that if you have a million cells, one of them will be reprogrammed. <laughs> and then, so you have to culture that cell and, and do it. So uh, a lot of work is more on the technical side, is how do you increase, again, the expression of this without doing the viral transfection, as well as increasing the number of cells that actually get reprogrammed. Have you, are you guys familiar with this work? This was quite popular yeah. in the literature. Yeah, okay. There are a lot of modes Should I go on or? Okay. Okay, so uh, this is, you know, the value of understanding how you form these guys, because even if you start here, you still need to know the pathways to get the type of organ that you want. So in going back to the skin, um, uh, how do you, you know, where does the skin from, come from? So during development, you have what's called this epidermal ectoderm, separated by the basement membrane to form this uh, mesenchymal thing. And then this epidermal ectoderm gives rise to all the epithelial cells, the epidermis, hair follicle, and sebaceous gland. I don't know if you guys remember from my last lecture, I told you that all these three different structures come from one progenitor cell, and that's these guys here. And the fibroblasts come from these mesenchymal stem cells uh, that are located within the dermis, okay? So what the point is of this thing is that there's two different progenitor cells giving rise to one organ, right? And I mentioned also before that the epidermis is this stratified epithelium, but uh, it's not too important for this uh, talk. Um, so what basically holds these cells together, right, to form a tissue? And essentially, a lot of that is due to these intercellular adhesion proteins called e cadherin that form an adhesion junction. So the structure of this um, adhesion junction is a transmembrane protein called e cadherin, this green one, and it's linked to the actin cytoskeletal network through linker proteins such as beta catenin and alpha catenin. Okay, and so what that does is that it not only holds the cells together, but it, uh, it also physically connects the cells to form what this red line is supposed to mean an actin belt, right? And that's important because it's one way of integrating individual cells into a whole tissue. So theoretically, if you push on this side of the cell, because the cytoskeletal, cytoskeletons are linked, the force can be felt from cells, I mean, it dissipates as you go further away from the stimulus, but theoretically that mechanical stimulus can be felt by other cells because of the linkages of its actin cytoskeleton, right? And so this e cadherin is actually quite important. So uh, it's, if you look at the actin network within these individual cells, you can see them uh, organized as stress fibers. But there's no org you know, organization from cell to cell. If you in, uh, induce adherence junction formation and the formation of uh, e cadherin at base adhesion junctions, uh, you can see that the e cadherin, which is in red, form a bridge between the two cells where the actin cytoskeletons are organized along multiple cell lengths, right? So that's the idea that you push on this cell, this cell will feel it because the tension is transferred through the cytoskeleton. And this is actually uh, due to these adhesion junctions because if you knock out this protein alpha catenin, which links e cadherin to the actin cytoskeleton, the actin network is no longer 
organized among different cells. I don't know if you can get that one. <laughs> ok, eh, abbiamo visto nelle prime immagini che ci sono in realtà due diversi tipi di cellula che danno vita a un unico organo. Eh, ci siamo chiesti quindi cos'è che poi effettivamente va ad unire le cellule per formare un tessuto eh, e um, il ruolo, le catering svolge un ruolo fondamentale in questo proprio perché unisce le cellule e va ad integrare cellule che sono singole, che sono individuali in un unico tessuto. Eh, Nell'immagine in basso vediamo la formazione di fibre dove le catering eh, come si può vedere nella seconda immagine forma una sorta di eh, ponte trasferendo quindi eh, la tensione da, in, da una sede all'altra dell'organo. Ok, so that's how you hold the tissue together, but um, how does the hair follicle form? Because I told you that's going to be our model system to understand how organs form. So, As I mentioned, you have an undifferentiated epithelium, the uh, epidermal ectoderm, that are hold to held together by E. cadherin. Uh, the epithelium, the black line is the basement membrane, and the yellow are the mesenchymal stem cells. Um, so the, there is some unknown signals that tell these stem cells that you're going to become a hair follicle, and people are still trying to figure out what this signal is. If you don't get a signal, the stem cells are going to make epidermis, epidermal keratinocytes. So the epidermis is the default pathway. If you want to become a hair follicle, you have to receive some signal, but we still don't know what that signal is. After that initial signal, there's various uh, signaling pathways that have been reported that we uh, formed what's called this plaque coat or this local thickening within the uh, epidermis, and you have this underlying um, uh, fibroblast start to aggregate underneath it. Um, this um, is interesting because the E-cadherin-based adhesion switches to a different type of cadherin called P-cadherin, right? And that becomes um, um, interesting because this switch from E-cadherin to P-cadherin is known as a cadherin switch, and it's a common feature in multiple uh, types of uh, development, such as gastrulation, no crust formation, genital uh, ridge population, and in diseases such as metastasis, one of the hallmarks of metastasis is the downregulation of E-cadherin. And they switch, instead of to P-cadherin, they switch to N-cadherin, but there's a cadherin switch. So in, again, this is another example by which disease just basically usurps stuff that happens during normal development, okay? And then as you grow longer, you get this uh, thing that's called the hair germ, And P-cadherin still, and it goes back to E-cadherin, but the leading edge still expresses P-cadherin. And you have this thing called a dermal condensate, which are mesenchymal cells. And what happens is there's an exchange of signals between these groups of cells and these groups of cells that guide the formation of this hair follicle. And it's these signals here that ultimately make the uh, mature hair follicle there, okay? So these are the extracellular signals that guide hair follicle morphogenesis. The question is, what do they do and how can you control them in a temporal fashion in order to understand organogenesis? And essentially the whole mechanism that I'm uh, listing here is um, going to be diagrammed here. So you have that undifferentiated epithelium that's pluripotent or multipotent. It can become epidermis or hair follicle. There's some signal that leads to the formation of this bud structure. This thing here. Okay. And this bud structure is basically, if you look at different things, is the precursor to the morphogenesis of liver, lungs, the mammary gland, and teeth, right? So this is a precursor structure. So this is that morphometric module I was talking about. If you understand this bud formation, you know the beginnings of the different um, types of organ development, right? And so what we're going to use is the hair follicle as our model system, right? Because again, I can get rid of the hair follicle, mess it up genetically, and the mass is going to be fine. You don't want to do that to the liver and lungs uh, of the animal, okay? Okay. 
Quindi la domanda che ci siamo posti è più che altro come mettere insieme i tessuti. Eh, abbiamo visto l'epitelio indifferenziato con eh, la presenza dei catering che contribuisce allo sviluppo follicolare. Eh, nelle slide precedenti abbiamo visto le diverse, la formazione dell'epidermide del placoid in cui i fibroblasti cominciano ad aggregarsi gli uni gli altri. Eh, mh, Secondariamente l'e-catering eh, ha subito diciamo, una trasformazione, un, un cambiamento, trasformandosi proprio in p-catering eh, e questo mh, può portare a, ad esempio alla metastasi, parlando proprio di malattie. Eh, tutti questi, questi gruppi di cellule vanno quindi a formare i follicoli eh, eh, dando proprio dei segnali che sono extracellulari, quindi eh, che non sono direttamente eh, parti della cellula. Quindi come possiamo capire questa genesi degli organi? Eh, sicuramente concentrandosi sul, uh, sull'epitelio e sulla formazione di, della struttura che abbiamo visto, ecco, che vediamo lì alto, cosiddetta BAD. Um, e, ecco, qui vedete anche la morfogenesi legata ad organi quali ad esempio il, i, il fegato e i polmoni e questo ci è utile proprio per capire lo sviluppo degli organi all'interno del, del corpo. Ok, so like other groups in the world we take the same strategy to elucidate the mechanisms regulating uh, body morphogenesis. So the first thing is to identify the morphogen or the extracellular signal that initiates this whole process. What is the transcription factor that is downstream of this uh, um, X signal? Then what are the target genes of this transcription factor? And finally, how does this target gene uh, change the cell behavior or phenotype of the, um, of the uh, cell? So, you know, our segue into understanding uh, hair, hair bud morphogenesis came from a um, paper that was published in the lab where I did my postdoc, where here's this uh, bud, hair bud morphogenesis, here's the epidermis, and here's the dermis. And these guys, these cells got a signal to tell them you're going to become hair follicle, right? And the transcription factor that was um, turned on in these cells was beta catenin, okay? And so this uh, basically was done by using a reporter assay. Are you guys familiar with Top Flash Reporter? Conoscete il Top Flash Reporter? Okay, so essentially what the lab did is they made a transgenic mouse where every cell expressed this reporter construct, okay? So what it is is a multimerized version of top sites or the TCF left optimal promoter binding sites, right? driving beta-galactosidase. So what this means is that any cell that express left beta-catenin will turn on this construct to express beta-galactosidase. And you can see which cells has active left one beta-catenin. That's how this reporter construct worked. And we just uh, said, okay, we found out when I was looking at this, this is turned on in the hair bud. So that's one, uh, two transcription factors that are expressed in the hair bud that are, might be responsible for the uh, bud formation. Eh, una strategia simile ehm, viene utilizzata per capire proprio il meccanismo di regolazione della morfogenesi del BAD, cosiddetto BAD follicolare. Eh, si parte quindi da determinati segnali per arrivare poi a comprendere quale sia il comportamento della cellula. Eh, abbiamo qui eh, abbiamo parlato anche degli esperimenti che vengono condotti nei topi, eh, sui topi transgenici. Eh, e vediamo che tutte le cellule esprimono eh, un beta, mh, scusate, beta galactosidase. Ok, so essentially what we have here is we found this portion of this pathway, right? We found which transcription factor was expressed in the bud. Now we want to fill in the top and bottom parts. So one of the questions that we have is, We have beta catenin and left one in the cells that we're going to become hair follicle. What are the extracellular signals that basically lead to the formation of this transcription factor? Okay? 
So we're just basically trying to find what are the extracellular morphogens that turn on this transcription factor that says you're going to become a hair follicle. Okay. Um, so what, we'll focus on um, what turns on the beta-catenin uh, genes. Are you guys familiar with the WINT pathway? WINT. Conoce del WINT? <laughs> WNT. Yes, so it's actually an important uh, uh, signal that's involved in a lot of different things. But it's known to turn on beta catenin, okay? And I, I don't want to go to the details, but it's known that um, WINT through this signaling pathway can lead to beta catenin and beta catenin transcription, okay? Uh, that, the details are not important, okay? So WINT can turn on beta catenin. So the question that we had, and um, the other thing was that it's been shown in the literature that BNP signaling regulates left expression, right? And again, this is details that you guys don't need to know. Um, so the thing that we then tested is, is WINT an inhibitor of BNP responsible for the formation of that left one beta catenin complex, right? So what we did is we just took uh, those um, uh, multipotent cells and then we treated them with beta catenin, and then you can see that, uh, sorry, we treated them with WINT. And you can see that in the presence of WINT, beta catenin goes nuclear, okay? But it has no effect on LEF1 expression. However, if we treated the cells with noggin, we can get LEF1 expression in the nucleus, but that has no effect on the levels of beta catenin, right? But I told you it's a LEF1 beta catenin complex that is the transcription factor. So when we added both Wint and Noggin, we can get nuclear beta catenin and nuclear LEF1. Okay, so the signal to say you're going to become a hair follicle is the product of two different extracellular stimuli, Wint and Noggin, and that seems to be turning on beta catenin and LEF1, the transcription factor. And I mean, this is just basically a um, protein level view, RNA and stuff like that. Abbiamo parlato dei fattori eh, che troviamo espressi nel BAD, cerchiamo quindi di capire eh, qua, um, come si forma un follicolo pilifero e quindi quando è che riusciamo a capire che quello diventerà un follicolo. Eh, abbiamo parlato del, del trattamento delle cellule attraverso il WINT, attraverso la B-catenin, che eh, sono appunto due procedimenti diversi attraverso cui arriviamo a capire che si sta formando un follicolo. Ok, so basically we're going to argue that WINT turns on beta catenin and noggin turns on left one. And they both go into the nucleus, but are they transcriptionally active, right? Just because they're at the right place doesn't mean they're functional. So again, we use the same top flash um, reporter construct. We put that in the cell and then ask, can wind and noggin turn this on? Because the wind and noggin, this is responsive only when these two transcription factors are, are functional within the nucleus, okay? So essentially what this basically shows here is that only when you present a, a wind and noggin do you get a substantial increase in this reporter construct, which requires both LEF1 and beta catenin. So you require both wind and noggin to get transcriptional activity. Okay? So they go into the nucleus and they're functional at a transcriptional level. Okay? Um, now, this is all done in vitro. Is this happening also in vivo? And we can test that, right? So what we did is that we uh, tested for uh, the expression of LEF1 in wild, and beta catenin in wild type skin. And like I said, both LEF1 and beta catenin are expressed in the hair blood, and the transcription factor is active because it turns on that reporter construct in this hair blood. Okay. You require noggin because if you look at a noggin knockout, LEF1 doesn't uh, get turned on in the presumptive hair blood. And beta catenin is slightly increased, but it, there's not too much in the nucleus, right? So you get more beta catenin, but not enough. So is this lack of nuclear beta catenin because there is no left one? So we tested that by adding left one specifically in this noggin knockout, right? And then, so left one is expressed now all over the place. 
and data contained in its noun back into the nucleus. Okay? So again, noun getting turned on left one, but this left one is required for beta catenin to go into the nucleus. If you only have lint, you'll increase the amount of beta catenin, but it primarily stays in the cytoplasm. Okay? And that's why you don't have um, transcriptional activity in the hair bud. Okay? So altogether, this is just some of the part that will be easy, is that the morphogens that we found are noggin, which is an inhibitor of BMP, and wind. Noggin turns on left one, and wind turns on beta catenin, and together they work as a transcription factor, okay, for hair follicle morphogenesis. Il Noggin è un inibitore e lavora attraverso, lavora insieme al WNT per formare proprio il fattore della trascrizione. Oh, okay. Um, so the next question then is what is left, what are the target genes of left one beta catenin that is actually making the hair follicle form? Um, so to describe that, I just wanted to mention again um, that the hair is a regenerating organ, right? The whole idea is like, can we understand regeneration by understanding development? So morphogenesis, again, is the uh, um, initial development of the organ, in this case, the hair. And the hair undergoes a hair cycle. So um, it grows in a, a path in a phase called antigen. It uh, dies in a phase called catagen. There's a resting period, and then you have, uh, which is called telogen, and then you activate the antigen again to reform the hair follicle. And you, throughout the life of the animal or the person, the hair constantly cycles over and over and over again, right? And it turns out that the same proteins and pathways that are activated during morphogenesis are active here, right, after it's formed for the new recycling or the regeneration of this hair follicle. So... Um, this is the part that we're going to study now, the regeneration part. So from this telogen or the resting phase to the antigen, which is the new formation of this new hair follicle here. Okay, so the hair follicle is going to be uh, uh, formed again once it is dead. And this is actually quite interesting because <clears throat> these are the, uh, it's been found that uh, noggin, which we reported from the uh, mesenchymal uh, component, and it's an inhibitor of BMP signaling, works together with WINT to form this uh, nuclear beta catenin left complex, leading to CMEC expression and hair follicle stem cell proliferation. Okay, so I'm just giving you um, some of the, the summary of what we found happens in the transition of these um, stem cells here to form a new hair follicle. Okay, and it's quite interesting because the same pr uh, proteins that noggin um, Wnt, Lef, beta catenin are the same proteins required for the initial formation of the uh, hair follicle itself. And what's happening during the re uh, regeneration of this organ is that they're, saying they're just recycling this developmental program to do regeneration. So again, this comes to the idea that an understanding of developmental biology provides a lot of insights into how you can get regeneration to occur. Concentriamoci quindi adesso sulla formazione dei follicoli eh, perché è proprio partendo dalla, da, da una comprensione più approfondita del, di come funzioni eh, la, la formazione dei follicoli possiamo arrivare in realtà a capire come funziona la rigenerazione. Um, quindi abbiamo visto nella slide precedente proprio il ciclo che viene, eh, il ciclo che segue tutta la formazione del, del follicolo eh, e grazie a questo possiamo appunto capire in cosa consista la rigenerazione. Eh, L'anagen di cui si vedeva ecco, anche qui eh, è proprio legato alla formazione del nuovo follicolo e quindi vediamo che la, la proteina, che, che la Noggin lavora con il Wnt per la pro pro proliferazione delle cellule staminali che vanno poi a formare i follicoli. Quindi in qualche modo sono le stesse proteine che eh, vanno a, ehm, ad attivarsi, che vanno a, a lavorare sia nella formazione follicolare che nella rigenerazione. Ok. So 
This is basically a summary again of what we found. So there is a signal from the ectoderm, which is Wnt, and a signal from the dermis, which is noggin, that together Wnt and noggin form the left one beta catenin transcription factor that somehow leads to this change in the morphology of the cell, right? Um, and as I said, one of the things that occur from a sheet of cells that is E. cadherin uh, based to a bud is that it switches from E. cadherin to P. cadherin, right? So the question that we had, is E. cadherin a target of the left one beta catenin transcription complex that's required for that cadherin switch that I talked about, right? And again, remember, this is almost like a controlled metastatic event. You need to downregulate E. cadherin to allow the cells to invaginate down into the dermis to form the hair follicle, right? And you can think again, this is metastasis is just the exaggerated form of budding morphogenesis because in this case, you have the basement membrane that doesn't completely dissolve, so you maintain the separation of the epithelial cells from the mesenchymal cells. But in metastasis, this basement membrane breaks apart and then the cells can uh, s start spreading throughout the tissue. Okay, so this is actually kind of in uh, interesting because this is the, uh, a picture of how the cadherin dynamics work. So this white dotted line is the basement membrane. Here's the epidermis, and here's the dermis. And this is the bud where the new hair follicle is going to be formed. And as you can see that in the areas where left one is expressed in this bud, E. cadherin is downregulated. Right? So there is a correlation already, if you just look at staining, that there might be some connection there. And if you look at other places of the, um, in the hair follicle, so this is a mature hair follicle, the green is E. cadherin. Wherever left one is expressed, E. cadherin is not present anymore. So in this case, left one is expressed in the matrix. There's no E. cadherin in this matrix there. So there was ample evidence that uh, E. cadherin might be repressed by this left one beta catenin complex. And again, this um, um, showed that when left one beta catenin is, is active in the hair bud, it's the same place where E. cadherin is, is down regulated. So how do we test this idea if left one beta catenin is responsible for E. cadherin expression? So we use a lot of um, different uh, knockout mice. So this basically is the wild type mouse, epidermis on top, dermis at the bottom, and these are the growing hair follicles in the mouse, right? And as I said, the leading edge of the bud is E. cadherin negative. And instead, they turn on P. cadherin. So this is that cadherin switch from E. cadherin to peak adherent. Now, if we knock out LEF1, which I said is the transcription factor required for it, there is still E cadherent in the bud, right? So LEF1 is required to downregulate E cadherent. What about beta catenin? So we have a beta catenin knockout, and uh, LEF1 is still expressed in the hair bud, but there's no downregulation of E cadherent at this site. So even though you have left one expressed there, in the absence of beta catenin, E. cadherin does not go down. Oh, actually, I think I could just write it. So left one beta catenin blocks E. cadherin. That. <laughs> okay? That's all this data shows. Huh? There should be a way to That's okay, I need it again anyway. So. Okay. That's all that is. English. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, this, you know, this was the other way of doing it is what happens if you have more beta catenin? Right? Does that promote hair follicle morphogenesis? And this was kind of a stupid experiment, but it's kind of uh, cute because people like it. We were able to make a very furry mouse by overexpressing beta catenin. Okay? So telling that you need beta catenin in order to get a hair follicle morphogenesis. So here's the wild type mouse, and then its litter mate that has overexpression of beta catenin. It actually looked like a, a, a ball of fur kind of a stuff because there's extra hair follicles forming there. Okay? Oh, I thought you knew. <laughs> beta catenin. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So uh, beta catenin is required there. Um, so this was the uh, um, 
question that we had now. So beta catenin left one mediates e cadherin repression. But at the time of that this work was done, everybody in the field argued that left one beta catenin only functions as a transcriptional activator. That was the paradigm in the field. It's an activator, it's an activator. So when we were trying to submit this paper, nobody believed, <laughs> believed us. So, you know, it, so if it was an activator, there's uh, one way that this could repress e cadherin. It's possible that it wasn't direct, that left one beta catenin activated a repressor, and then the repressor repressed e cadherin. Okay, so that's one way that if it was an activator. Or the other way which we were proposing was that, well, there's an unknown function of left beta catenin as a transcriptional repressor. It could bind directly the e cadherin promoter and turn off its expression, right? But this was not known for the longest time. This was the, the dogma in the field. So basically to test that, I cloned out the um, e cadherin promoter, and there's a left one binding site at this uh, region here. And what I did is that I made a mutation, a site-directed mutagenesis at this site to basically make it uh, insensitive to binding to left one again, right? And then there's another um, box, uh, sorry, a binding site downstream of that, which can bind the transcription factor SNAIL that I was talking about earlier. And SNAIL is the first uh, reported function of SNAIL was as an e cadherin repressor. Okay, so I was just using that as a control. Okay, so let's just go through this chart here. So in blue is this wild type e cadherin promoter driving beta galactosides. So I'm just measuring beta galactosides as a, a surrogate for transcriptional activity. When you add left one or beta catenin alone, it really doesn't much have an effect on the expression of e cadherin. When you add both left one and beta catenin, you get a 50% decrease in e cadherin promoter activity. So you need both to repress e cadherin. Now the question is, is this direct or indirect, right? Is the left one beta catenin activating a repressor or is it binding directly here? So to test that is that, okay, what if we mutate the site that left one can no longer bind? What we find is that if left one can no longer bind, the e cadherin promoter is, is still active, okay? So it suggests that there's direct binding is of left one beta catenin is required to repress e cadherin promoter activity. And this was done with the snail, which binds here. Because whenever you make a site-directed mutagenesis, you don't know, especially for chromatin architecture, you don't know if you're, you're messing up the global uh, architecture of the chromatin, which is why the repression or expression is affected. So we s tested to see whether this uh, promoter was still sensitive to snail, which I told you was a reported repressive e-cadherin. And both the wild type and the mutant promoter can be repressed by snail. Okay, so this is, mutating of this side is not just having some global effect on gene expression, okay? And in fact, if you add both snail and the left one beta catenin, you can get even additive effect of repressing e cadherin, okay? But then in the mutant one, it only behaves as if it's only seeing snail, because again, it's insensitive to the left one beta catenin. They the, told me that it's true. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay, so basically the image is telling you that you need to bind these two to the promoter to repress e cadherin. That's it. Okay, so we were using LEF1 and beta catenin as the um, repressors of it, but we were arguing that noggin and Wnt are the upstream activators of that transcription factor, right? So if they're the upstream act activators, they should have the same effect as the, down, the transcription factors. And in fact, it does. When you add noggin and went together, it has the same effect as beta catenin and left one, okay? And again, it's insensitive when you mutate the left one binding site. So this supports our notion that noggin produces left one, wind produces beta catenin, and together they form a transcription factor that uh, directly binds and represses the e cadherin promoter. And then, um, do you guys know the technique of how do you tell if a transcription factor is directly binding to a piece of DNA? Conoscete il modo in cui il fattore di trascrizione sia legato al DNA? There are uh, specific domain in the promoter uh, the transcription factor uh, um, uh, bind this uh, dominion and uh, changes the structure of uh, the region. 
but how do you prove it that it's actually binding? Right? Come riesci a provare right? Because the domain is always present, but the transcription factor doesn't always bind. With the mutation uh, in the domain. Well, I did that, but how do you show that it's directly binding at that time? Come dimostri che effettivamente c'è un legame? What technique do people use? Quale tecnica utilizzi? Huh? Well, to some extent. To some extent. <laughs> but this footprinting is, is uh, that's a good one. What is the more up-to-date technique that people use? Quella va bene, però ce n'è una ancora più aggiornata. So that will tell you that it's bound, but what, what's a much easier way to do it rather than using radioactivity and all this stuff? Immaginate proprio di farlo e quale tecnica usereste? It's a common molecular biology technique now. È una tecnica legata alla biologia molecolare. Anyone please? <laughs> We know the transcription factor. Okay. I want to know, is it binding to this site, the endogenous site, on, in the cell, on the cellular DNA? Is it binding? Huh? Well, labeling the protein. Okay, I'll give you that. So okay, ve lo dico io. What you can do is what's called chromatin IP. Have you guys chromatin immunoprecipitation? Yeah. That's uh, yeah. <laughs> right. So right. So you get an antibody to left one, pull it down and see if that um, piece of DNA is also the DNA that you're interested in basically also gets immunoprecipitated along with the protein. Right? So your protein is bound to the chromatin, and if you pull down the protein, the DNA should also be pulled down. And basically, that's what we showed here. When you have um, WIN3A and the left one added, when you use an antibody against left, uh, left one, you can pull down the piece of DNA. Um, that's why you have to run a gel. You do a PCR to check to see if your piece of DNA basically was immunoprecipitated. Okay? So that's a common technique now that people are using for checking to see if the site is engaged with the transcription factor under any uh, different uh, circumstances. Okay. So this basically is uh, to show that uh, noggin is required for ecoherin down regulation in vivo. So if you have a noggin, so here's the wild type. Again, ecoherin is down regulated, right? In the absence of noggin, ecoherin is not down regulated. And so this is basically a cartoon of what we find. So in order to form this hair bud, you get wind that is per, uh, produced from the epithelial cells and noggin from mesenchymal cells. And that's quite interesting, right? So you're getting one signal from one type of cell and another signal from another type of cells, and they work together to form this beta catenin left one complex. This translocates into the nucleus where you can uh, repress e -cuterin. Okay, so essentially uh, we have the morphogen, the transcription factor, a target gene, and now the question is, well, what is the effect of downregulating e -cuterin? Okay, so what's, okay, I won't ask the question. <laughs> so one way of actually testing what is the function of this downregulation of e -cuterin is to say what happens if you elevate the levels? What would happen if you prevent that downregulation? So I generated a transgenic mouse that basically overexpresses e cadherin throughout the epidermis, okay? And what you can see here is that here's the uh, histology. You can see these hair follicles, these hair buds coming down from the epidermis, right? When there's too much e cadherin, you saw no hair follicle morphogenesis at all, okay? So that downregulation of e cadherin is required for the migration and invagination of the hair, fo of the hair cells down into the dermis. If you don't uh, downregulate e cadherin, you don't get this invagination of the cells to form that bud. Okay? And then if you count basically the um, uh, number of hair follicles that form, there's about an 80% uh, decrease in the amount of hair follicles in the e cadherin transgenic mouse versus the wild type. And that's very similar to what you see with the noggin knockout. So no hair follicles forming when you get uh, 
uh, in the absence of noggin or eke adherin is not downregulated. And basically, this is what we, uh, uh, when we, we did some studies on that. So uh, in the wild type animal at newborn, you have the different stages of the hair follicle growth, right? And as you guys know, well, I don't know if you know, mice, the hair follicle formation is not uniform, okay? La formazione dei follicoli nei topi non è uniforme. Right. Because if that was true, the hair, fo hair follicles fall out. Then the mouse would be hair, hairless, hair, hairless, right? Perché altrimenti ci sarebbero topi con peli, topi senza right. peli. So how the mouse skin works, it's basically in sequence. You have um, hair follicles at different stages of development and different stages of the hair cycle so that you're not all hair no hair, all hair, right? There's a mixture. Quindi ci sono diversi cicli di formazione eh, follicolare e quindi diversi stadi. So essentially these are the different stages of the hair follicle morphogenesis at a new, when the mouse is initially born. You have it at all these different stages in, in uh, blue, right? They're generally more towards the more mature hair follicles, but you still have new ones that are forming. What we found in the EKD and transgenic mouse is that most of them in red were stuck at this stage of development, again, as if they couldn't invaginate down. And similar to when you remove noggin, which is the transcription factor, uh, the morphogen that makes LEF1 required for e adherin down regulation is almost similar to that yellow. It's primarily um, blocked at the early stages of development. Okay, so <clears throat> essentially what we did is that when we made this transgenic mouse, we lost the e adherin gradient in the transgenic epidermis. And what I mean by that is that if you go from the basement membrane here to the surface of the skin, the stratum cornea here, there is a gradient of e adherin, right? So it's low at the bottom, and it gets stronger as you go up. We made a transgenic mouse where we basically made it uniform throughout the epidermis, okay? So what that does, we were a little surprised. So this actually um, blocked hair follicle morphogenesis. So that was one phenotype that we saw. No hair follicles when you have too much eukadherin. What was surprising about this was that we also saw a defect in epidermal differentiation. As if the cells, when they have too much eukadherin, not only don't make hair follicles, but they said, we're going to make more epidermis. And that's what we saw here. So I told you that we can track the differentiation program of the epidermis by different markers that mark each layer of the tissue, right? And that's what we did here. So in wild type, you have uh, red is the basement membrane, laminin here. Keratin 5 is the basal layer here. And then keratin 1 is the uh, spinous layer, which is here, right? And you see this black uh, space here is where the basal layer should be, okay? So this is basically uh, the data that's pictorially um, represented there, right? So loracrine is near the surface, so this part will be blank, and then you have the basement membrane here. The important part of this, basically, when we did this, was that the basal layer is still present, but keratin-1 is turned on very, very fast. Remember, there should be a gap here where the basal layer cells are, because this is a differentiated marker. What we're seeing is that the marker is turned on very quick. And what that means is that the cells are prematurely going into the epidermal fate, not the hair follicle fate, okay? So an adhesion protein, which is strange, uh, e-cadherin, which is originally studied to hold cells together, can determine whether you form a hair follicle, and if you don't form a hair follicle, it pushes the cells to adopt an epidermal fate. Okay, so you have a cell-cell junction protein that is basically functioning as a cell fate determinant. It's kind of important, but I don't know. <laughs> okay, so how is this doing it? Okay, so essentially we have noggin, wnt, forming this left one beta-catenin transcription complex, and this determines whether e-cadherin is high or low, okay? When e adherin is low, then you can get a hair follicle fate. If e adherin is, uh, is high, the cells decide they want to become epidermis, 
right? And this is adhesion junction protein again, right? So it's very strange. A cell that basically is supposed to hold cells together is determining whether the cell is going to become an epidermis or hair follicle. And this is actually um, interesting because this is a schematic of an adhesion junction, right? This is E. cadherin, that transmembrane protein that's bound to the actin cytoskeleton, right? And I told you guys that it's beta catenin and alpha catenin link it to the actin cytoskeleton. But that was an oversimplified version. You have all these different molecules present at the adhesion junction, right? And I told you beta catenin can also act as a transcription factor, right? So the, the thing is that's becoming uh, apparent now is that these E. cadherin proteins, they do modulate cell-cell adhesion, but they can be a receptor or a sensor for the cell also. When E. cadherin is down, where do all these proteins go, right? They're not sequestered in the adherence junction anymore. In one case, beta catenin is allowed to go into the nucleus and say, become a hair follicle, right? That goes back to this point here. E. cadherin is low. You release beta catenin from the plasma membrane, it goes into the nucleus. It could program the cells, become a hair follicle. And what's interesting about this is all these different proteins have been reported to also have transcriptional activity, right? So releasing these things can change the program of the cell because now all these transcription factors are free to do their work and have their own target genes, okay? And in that way, it's possible that E. cadherin can affect polarity, differentiation, block proliferation, and block motility, right? By one adhesion junction protein because this now it's either sequesters or frees these transcription factors based on whether or not adhesion junctions are formed. Okay? Oh, I think that's it. Yeah. Questions? Ho finito. Ci sono domande? No. Okay. Thank you. Grazie. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.